the Lord really revealed to me the essence of what it means to live a Christian life, at least the beginning of that. I'm going to put you in a position of influence over these other young men. What are you going to do with that? If you can recognize it, if you can say, okay, I know right now I am wandering in the desert. It's a much different perspective because you, that's actually ordained. The Lord has done that to almost everyone. It's not just you. Good afternoon and welcome again to another episode of Legacy Men's Podcast. My name is Gary Trevor, your host and my co-host, Jason Gonzalez. Hey, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Legacy Men's Podcast. Here we, we learn how to live and leave a godly legacy. Uh, thank you so much for subscribing and sharing this content with others. Uh, today we have Alex Aragin here with us. Uh, Gary, will you let us know a little bit about uh, Alex's background and uh, education? Absolutely. So Alex is a, an esteemed professor at one of our local colleges in Mesa, born in Mexico, came out to the United States when he was six with his family, happily married for uh, 21 years, has got two beautiful children, and loves the Lord. And I would really ask Amen. that you would listen to this man because now we deal with a whole cultural difference since he has the background of being born in Mexico, and they still visit back and forth as well. So thank you, Alex, for coming in this afternoon. We appreciate it muchly. So talk to us about your birth in Mexico, when you came out to, I believe it was Los Angeles, and okay. kind of fill us into that part as well. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, it's, you know, I remember very little in terms of those first five, or six, seven years you know, being in Mexico. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, that I remember. My dad uh, didn't finish uh, high school, and neither did my mom. And so my dad was a mechanic uh, early, early in those years in Mexico. And, uh, you know, but the one thing that even in those early, really formative years, uh, I do remember them sending me to not the local school, but we would, my mom would drive or would get in the bus, drive 45 minutes to a private preschool, a private, uh, uh, you know, elementary kindergarten at that, at that particular right. junction. Yeah. And so then apparently you went into, your parents also paid for you to go to um, a Catholic set of schools. So basically elementary through high school, correct? Yeah. I mean, I didn't know at the time that what they were doing, they were really kind of setting this foundation that for them, education was always the key to a good life, right. right? To to improve my life, I needed to take education seriously. And so at an early age, they were always sacrificing everything just so that I could, uh, you know, I was successful in, um, in my academics, right? And so for them, it was always a sacrifice to send me to private schools, but that's what they, you know, that's what they were really wanting to do. Yeah, I wanted to uh, ask a question, because uh, Gary, you just asked so many great questions about the Hispanic culture, right, the Latin culture. Right. And um, so you're uh, born in Mexico, around the age of seven is when your uh, parents came out to the States. And um, I'm first born, next generation, Gonzalez, right? My uh, parents are from uh, Guatemala. Um, and you know, why did your parents come out here to the States? Why, why did they move to LA? I think it's probably very similar to why a lot of people still come here. And part of it is they just saw that this was a ticket to a better life. Not necessarily even for themselves, to be quite honest with you, but for me. Because though their life certainly improved when they got here, they were always looking at that next generation, which was me. And I think so for them, it, was, it wasn't just their ticket out for them to, to improve financially, but it was really they saw uh, that this was their opportunity to pass on to me and put me in a position where my life was simply going to be a little bit better, a little bit more successful, perhaps a little bit more content right, than their life, less struggle. And so that was, I think, probably the number one, the driving reason why um, why they left, and, and they left a lot behind. I mean, they left um, at, at that particular time. Both my uh, both both my grandparents were still alive, right? right. And so uh, I look back on that, and I and I ask, and I think about, gosh, what would it take for me right now in my stage in life to simply pick up and go to another country? 
Yeah. Not even for my benefit, but for the benefit of my kids. Right. That's wild to me yeah. to think about that you would just pick up and move like that. I just think it's so cool. I mean, generationally, whether you're Latino or, you know, South African, English, you know, uh, whatever that is, wherever you were born, at some point in time, someone made a decision to do that for those next generations. And um, this starts spilling into, you know, your faith and all that good stuff, which I wanted to get to later. But um, the part that where you're saying they provided that just in the meantime, they were, uh, your dad was a mechanic, right? So I'm sure there was some tough times there, just kind of working with his hands and putting in the work every single day. Uh, and your mom um, was a secretary. She left that in Mexico and then came here and was cleaning offices and worked in a fast food restaurant, which is reality for a lot of, you know, people that just go up from their countries, they leave whatever they were doing as their career. Uh, and then they come here and do some jobs that some individuals really don't want to do. Um, so just, I, I wanted to highlight that because it's like you're saying, they're not really doing it for themselves. They're doing it for those next generations that may have that opportunity to take advantage of um, all the th different things that this country has to offer, which I'm grateful for. Amen. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, the firstborn carries tremendous weight and the parents pay tremendous leverage on them as well. So the, in essence, they were bringing you out here. They were committing 100% to you, even though you had a very younger brother, seven years your junior, you were the person they were investing everything on. Is that, is that always been a cultural thing? And how did, that, how did that weigh on you, knowing you were basically carrying your, uh, a lot of your parents' responsibility? And truth, as you told us, because they didn't speak fl uh, English fluently, you had to intercede on their behalf on many transactions uh, including down the road when you had to, I think, file for, for Chapter 11 as well. Mm -hmm. How did that weigh on you as a, as a young man, Alex? Yeah, that, I mean, that was the weight of the responsibility of a firstborn Mexican son was something that through the course of my life, it was something that definitely was a heavy heaviness, right? It added a heaviness to my life because there was a responsibility that I felt to my parents because they had sacrificed so much. They had invested so much in just coming out here right. that I had to be a success. Otherwise, I would have looked at them and, and they might have thought to themselves, we did this for, for what? Because look what he has done with his life, right? And so that awareness was something that, that has become more and more a reality for me as I've gotten older. And maybe some of that comes with maturity, right? But uh, I felt that early on. And some of that, I mean, I've always felt a sense of responsibility to them uh, because of, what, of that initial move to come out here. And, but yeah, I mean, early on, I was, uh, that responsibility fell on me because I learned the language so quickly. And kids do. They just they learn do. languages very, very quickly once they move into and, and become part of that, the, the, you know, those communities and that culture. So for me, that I did that, which in turn put me in a position to always have to be the translator for the family, and the translator in pretty adult things, right? As you mentioned, I, well, first when they bought their first house, uh, it was a condo. I was the one that was sitting down with the real estate agent at the you know ripe age of probably twelve. And I'm sitting there having conversations about what this document means and what this document means to my parents. And I mean, I, I hardly understand what the legal documents mean in English, let alone trying to translate that back to, you know, to Spanish. So you can imagine that. But yeah, when they lost their house subsequent years later, you know, I had to do that again, right? And then I remember sitting there with them uh, in court with the judge talking to them about making wiser financial decisions, you know, and, uh, and then trying to translate that as well. So mm -hmm. early, early on, there was a lot of, I was put in positions where uh, it was bo mo mostly by necessity at that time for them. They put me in a position where I had to intercede on their behalf and be there for them. But that really, in many ways now, I, I look back, that was really preparing me for what, there was a cultural expectation that I had to live up to, right. you know, and, um, and so, you know, so that, that is something that I've, I, I used to struggle with because one of the differences uh, in, that I love about the United States is that here you're judged on you. 
Yep. Not on your family, not on what they did. Correct. Uh, but at the same time, I do have an affinity to my family. I do owe them uh, something that perhaps is lost in, you know, in American culture. Uh, and you know, so when I talk to other men, uh, you know, especially that are perhaps they have problems with their in-laws and so forth, you know, or problems in their own family. And, and I think it's, it's very easy for some people to just say, you know what, I'm going to take care of my immediate family, my wife, my kids, and anything outside of that, it doesn't bother me. And I've tried that. I can't do that. You know, that the, the presence of my family is, uh, of my, you know, my mother and before my, my father passed away, that's a big presence for me. And I do owe them a responsibility. Yeah. I think one of the cool things that you said about the, like, looking back at it and the learning process of it is that in the time, like, it may not look like it's something that's benefiting you, right? Having to go in there and doing all that translating and looking up all this different information that you're unaware, but it made you resourceful. So the Lord, like you said, was kind of putting you in positions to prepare you for a later stage. And that also taught you a lot of leadership qualities um, later on that you now use today um, with your marriage and uh, with your kids and even in ministry, which is really cool. Um, as far as like the, uh, yeah, like the cultural aspects of it. I mean, my wife is Filipino uh, and Spanish. And even on the Filipino side, I, I've noticed, you know, they do stick together um, a lot. They still have like those, you know, family reunions and gatherings. And I look at that and I'm like, man, that's, you know, that is something that here, because my family's not here, you know, they're in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do a lot of, right? Like we still do it with my immediate family, but um, definitely something to learn from if you're interested in learning about different cultures and stuff like that. I, I know a ton of people. I mean, Arizona is a, a hotbed for everybody's from somewhere else. Um, I mean, you see this in church too, but it's just like inviting people over for meals and just sharing like all the different music that you listen to, like the different meals that you cook from the different places that you're from. It's just so much fun to learn about different people's cultures. Yeah, it is. But then also just, you know, having that sense of that community that you can continue to hold and, and have with whether it be your family or friends is, is really neat. Yeah, Gary? The thing that really impressed me when talking to you was they put you in a college, a Christian college called Westmont in Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara's not cheap. And your father yeah. took out all his 401k. Walk us through that experience in Westmont College, because at the time you weren't a Christian, but you got into some very interesting scenarios that really helped you through that. So kind of share with us the Westmont experience in Santa Barbara. Yeah, West, I mean, yeah, Westmont is absolutely very expensive. <laughs> and, uh, and so at that time, I have had no awareness of what my parents were doing financially in the background to allow me to go to Westmont. And a matter of fact, even prior to that, when I went to a private high school, I had no idea that in the background, my parents were meeting with the financial office at the high school and making payment plans and, and leveraging this, leveraging that. I mean, there were so many things that were happening that my teenage self and then early into my 20s, I had no idea about that they were doing just to get me to through the, through the private education. Right. Uh, but Westmont, I think, was the place where the Lord really revealed to me the essence of what it means to live a Christian life, at least the beginning of that. Prior to that, for me, uh, growing up Catholic, for me, a Christian life... Um, or a religious life meant following a list of rules to do or not to do, right? And probably the best example of that is the Ten Commandments, right? It's pretty clear. Uh, and so I followed those simply because those were, it seemed easy, I can check those things off, right? Um, and, but prior to Westmont, I also, in something we talked about, right, I also saw God as a very, definitely a presence, but a very distant presence. Uh, I, would, I would pray to God somewhere above, you know, and I knew um, I had been to church enough and to mass enough to know and respect uh, the essence of who he was. But when I got to Westmont, it was as if God came down from that cloud that I always pictured him in. 
And it was the first time that I, I was able to really see God in, in my life, in my, with walking alongside me. And I had never seen that before because uh, for, for us growing up, religion was the thing that you did if you went to church on Sundays or at best, uh, sometimes if you were to go to Easter Mass or on uh, Christmas, then you behaved, then you acted like a, you know, like a good believer. But outside of that, there was very little manifestation of my faith or anyone else's faith in action. So when I got to Westmont, all of a sudden, for the first time, it's a small college. It's got 1,200 students, and it's hidden up in the hills of Montecito. So it is filled with about, of those 1,200 students, probably I would say about 1,100 of them are Christian, wow. strong Christian. Yeah. Wow. And I'm a deer in the headlights. I walk into Westmont, and I really, to be honest with you, I, I felt like I had no business being there because all of a sudden I was seeing these people my age that were not faking it, not faking. It really, I, I thought to myself, wow, you really believe in this stuff. Uh, mm. And I was beginning to see the Lord was bringing people into my life that were showing me this is the essence of a Christian life. This is the essence of this, right? And this was at 18, 18 19, right? Mm -hmm. And so this cracked me up because you're talking about how you get to this place and it's just like, so you're talking about like, and it's not just all Catholicism, you know, it's nothing, you know, about we're not knocking, you know, what no. the religion is. But um, what you noticed was that they were like, oh, we're going to church tonight and like we've got this thing on Wednesday. Oh, we're going to church again. It's like, oh, it's our Sunday thing. Oh, it's our, our Sunday afternoon. Oh, it's our Sunday worship night. And you're like, no, <laughs> like, no, this is like, this is me time. Like, this is not mandatory, but they, so, and then talk to us about the girl that oh, yeah. called you out. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, they, these people were just living yeah. for Christ and I didn't know what that even meant. Mm. Right. But yeah, it was, it was just every social gathering was Christ related. And it took me a long time to understand and to actually want to be there, part of it, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, I was, uh, you know, became friends with this, uh, you know, with this girl. And um, I, you know, I thought prior to this, you like someone, they like you, why not start dating? And I remember when I finally uh, asked her if she was interested, she, she said to me, Alex, you know, I, I am, I, I do like you, uh, but you're not nearly... Uh, as mature in your faith as where I would want you to be. And I mean, I didn't know, I, I didn't know what to do with that. What? Yeah. Okay. Like I go to church. I'm here. I don't understand what you mean by not. Right. And so that really shocked me because it was for the first time someone in this otherwise, you know, dating can be a very secular thing. Yep. And it was the first time that someone interjected Christ into an area of my life that I had never invited him into, right? And, and that's really what it was. It, Westmont was an introduction to all these spaces. I think I certainly compartmentalized my faith a lot. And so I thought, all right, well, you know what? I can, I can trust God in this. I can trust God in this area. But there are certain areas where stay out, stay out of my life. Dating at, as a teenager is one of those. And so for someone to interject that in was, was completely, uh, you know, mind-blowing for me. Mm -hmm. And that led me to, into the beginning of having many of those experiences, whether it was that or, for example, like, for example, I was thinking, what job do I want, right, as I was getting ready to graduate? And, you know, people kept saying, well, have you, have you gone to the Lord? You know, mm -hmm. what are you good at? What, is, what has he gifted you in? And that was a very, very different, again, once again, this, this is my career. What are you talking about? What am I good? What is God? It's my career. I should do whatever I want to do. And, but people were continually asking, you know, have you gone to the Lord on this? Have you sought wise counsel? All these things that just now I understand what they mean. But back then it was, it was all new. Cool. I want to go back into a seed that was planted in you. Um, and, and Gary, I'll, I'll let you take this. No, go here. ahead. But 16 years old, you prayed the prayer. Uh, go ahead, Gary. So you prayed the prayer of salvation. And so what, what got you to that, <laughs> to that prayer? 
a complete secular relationship, right? It was uh, a girl that I started dating my freshman year in high school, and when we were we we started to date, we never uh, she was they were not a Christian, but during the course of our relationship, her family was brought to the Lord, and and so all of a sudden. We were, you know, she was being asked to go to church with them. I was being, you know, I was invited to go to church. And, you know, I did what most guys do, which is like, sure, we're, whatever, I'll go wherever you want. You know, if I need to, if I want to date you, I got to do this. And so for probably a whole year, I went to on and off church with them and was complete just, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? Uh, but it was worth it because then I got to hang out with her. But, yeah, it was, uh, it was in between my, my junior, my sophomore and junior year, that we were at a church service. But what did, but what did she say to you? She said, what did she, tell, what did she tell you that she had these restrictions on your relationship, that if this didn't materialize, this wouldn't happen? Yeah. Again, you're talking about a, a Christian lady who set parameters, who set boundaries, which is so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that, the, in high school, it was, you know, it, it was this, she was basically saying, here, this is important to me. This is important to my family. And so if you want to be part of this, you need, this is what you need to do, you know? And once again, I, it wasn't me though, right? I was doing it for someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, but as to your point, I was, that was a seed mm -hmm. that the Lord was absolutely planted, planted in that relationship. Amen. And they began to go to church. And then they, they were the ones, her and her family were the ones that said, well, have you ever thought about going to Christian college? <laughs> no. <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. And matter of fact, I think that the only reason my parents said yes to go to a Christian college is because it was private. Mm -hmm. It was a private college. So to them meant, oh, that must be the next step to your education. So sure, go ahead and go to a Christian college. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, uh, so after this girl at that college told you you weren't mature enough in your faith, <laughs> you so not just that, right? <laughs> but she called you out on it. You did actually start focusing on your maturity, and you started doing some things at the college that I wanted you to kind of highlight. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that one of the first things, I mean, I started going to these social events hmm. that were that that were all around. Christ. So I did start doing that, right? I started uh, going to some Bible studies that were uh, during the week, you know, different, different uh, people at, in, at the college were hosting. Uh, and then, you know, uh, my junior year, there was an opportunity to be uh, a resident uh, assistant, which is in, in that case, I, I was, uh, I got my own room, but I was in charge of oversaw uh, about 20, 25 freshmen. And, and that was, I think that was really kind of the first step into like, all right, Lord, here we go. I'm going to do something. This is, doesn't, I, I don't really know why I'm doing this, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to do it anyway. And, but now all of a sudden it was like the first time the Lord was saying, I'm going to put you in a position of influence over these other young men. What are you going to do with that? And, and so that I was sure that uh, I wanted to do that, but I had no idea how to do that. And the good news is that when you become a resident assistant, you are one of probably, let's say, 20 resident assistants. And all the, the other 19 resident assistants had a lot, were just more mature than I was. And so that really led me to ask them, so what do you do? I mean, I don't, like, do we go drinking? Like, what do you do? You know, and no, no, why don't you, uh, you know, why don't you offer them if they want to do like a, you know, an accountability group? Why don't you, some of them may need an accountability partner. Uh, why don't you do, a, you know, a Bible study for them? Uh, why don't you go serve in Santa Barbara in the community? <laughs> what? Right? So it was these young people, because the men and women that were, without even thinking, they were pouring into my life. I mean, mm -hmm. it was, I mean, you can see the Lord just picking these certain people here, Alex, and here's another person, and here's another person. I was uh, drowning, right, in all these Christian, strong Christian examples that uh, it, it, you couldn't help but mature into that. And it was be because all of them, every day I was, I was exposed to that, that by the time I finished my junior year, sure enough, I, I, was, 
I definitely grew in that because I saw the responsibility that I had to other people. And I began to see my gifts being used by the Lord. Yeah. Uh, and that was really kind of the first inkling that I had. Maybe I could do this thing. Maybe I could teach, you know, and I, I never thought that I would do that. But my, so another thing, my parents, they had a rule that they needed me to be, they wanted me to be a doctor, a medical doctor. And that was the only reason they were going to pay, there was the only way that they were going to pay for my education. And so I had to double major because I didn't want to be a doctor, but they wanted me to be a doctor, so I had to major in biology. And they would look at all my grades in biology. But at some point I realized I like, I like reading and I like writing, so I wanted to major in English. So I double majored, right? And, but my junior year came around and I realized, I don't know what, I, I, I cannot be a doctor. I can't do it, I can't do it. And uh, so I took a trip with the college, we went to a, on a semester abroad. And there, it's a 20 of us, and it was a, it was a, it was a program where it was only for English majors. We were in Italy and we were in England, right? And here's a kid, I don't have money outside of when my parents are pouring into this. I don't know how my parents afforded it, right? But I'm over there and I remember seeing these people, their senior year, having conversations about what's next? What does the Lord want you to do? I remember one of my professors, you know, was talking about that. And once again, it's like, okay, here's this thing, the, this area of most people's lives that you don't invite God into, which is what is your career? My parents had, that, had answered that question for me, but it was the first time mm. that it was, nah, the Lord might say something about that. Yeah. And when I came back from that trip, I knew, all right, I, I, I want to be in front of people. Uh, I think that's what he's gifted me at. And uh, so you, the rest is sister. I've been teaching for 25 years. Yeah, that's cool. I, I wanted to uh, get your wife in, um, you know, without fast forwarding too much, but uh, I did want to get to your, uh, your father passing as well, because I, yeah. I think that's something we have to talk about. Um, but with your, your wife, you then met her, and you actually opposed the question to her about whether or not she was, you know, ready and mature in her faith, and that you were very serious about taking a step, but that it was going to be kind of like a, hey, like, I'm, I'm not looking to date too many people. We're going to, I'm, I'm looking to get serious, right? Yeah. Um, and you had uh, your, your two children as well, um, both daughters, right? Mm -hmm. Alexis and uh, Gabriella um, leading in the church. So now uh, you're actually uh, teaching in the church, uh, which is really cool. Uh, I believe it's, uh, which ministry Young is it? Young Families. Young Families. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, and then let, let's talk a little bit about your father, um, because there's just some things there that, and again, it's not about which religion, right? Like it, you know, but they did, your parents are Catholic, you know, they've been Catholic for a while, but through your journey, you were actually able to speak life into your father um, right before he passed. Can you kind of walk us through that? that? I know that was about two years ago and it, it you know, a little bit painful still, but if you could walk us through that, please. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my father, I think if I can, if I can characterize my father, it's he was probably the most hardworking man I've ever met in my life. And um, he was extremely, as I said, uh, very resourceful uh, and with very limited ed education, mind you, right? And so from an early, early, uh, all the way to, you know, before he passed away, he instilled in me this, um, well, this work ethic and this, hey, you can do anything, right? And one of the, that was interesting too because in some ways when I became a Christian, that reliance on me, that reliance on you can do everything if you just work hard enough, well, there was conflict, there was tension there because I think that one of the things that I was being called by the Lord when he called me is, I need you to stop relying on yourself. And I, you know, I, it took me a long time to really heed that, to mm. listen to that, because I had seen evidence both in my father and my parents, but also in my own life that I can do this life without the Lord. Maybe not my fullest life, but I can have an easy, successful life without the Lord. And so, that was his influence, and so when he 
was coming towards the end of his life. He got to a point because, you know, death does this to, to us, uh, where he could no longer save himself, right? There was no amount of, well, I just take another job, or I'll work extra hard, or I'll work long hours. There's nothing you can do, and he knew that, you know? And I think I remember um, seeing him in that state, and over the, the last about a month and a half of his life, I could see a sense of searching and desperation. There's an openness to him that I'd never seen before. Mm. And for the first time, I, I, I thought, okay, this is now my turn to tell him about my heavenly father. Praise God. And, and sure, I mean, it was probably about three or four weeks before he passed away that I was visiting at, at their house and we were just, I was sitting in bed with him talking and he was hungry. He wasn't eating much at that time, so he, I was going to go get some food for him. But, I mean, it was, it was one of those moments where you know the Lord is speaking to you. I could not, I got up, but I could not leave the room because I knew the Lord saying, right now, right now, I have set the conditions in heart for you to now pray. Mm, thank you, Jesus. You know, and so I said, oh, okay, Dad, and I'm trembling uh, because I've prayed that prayer, and I've, uh, in English, I've seen my girls pray that prayer, you know, to become Christians themselves. Mm. But here now, I, it's my father who is the one that's supposed to be leading me into these mm. moments. And now he's, I'm, I'm being asked to lead him, you know. And, uh, and, then, and then now to all of a sudden say this in, uh, in Spanish for him as well. So there's a lot there where these, you know, my life and his life and the influence of his, or our culture and my influence of my Christian life were coming together. And so it was a privilege to uh, sit down with him and, um, and, and lead him into that prayer. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that was, and, and you know, my, my brother and my mother were able to witness that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that that is, I hope, I, I, know, I do believe that that set, you know, that planted a seed in them. Mm -hmm. um, what did you say that his, uh, his heart was susceptible to hearing or uh, conditioned. Yeah. I mean, I think that or, I, I really felt like, uh, yeah. you know, the Lord was <laughs> preparing, yeah. he had prepared yeah. his heart. Yeah. That's really cool. I, um, so just to kind of close out, um, here with you today, um, you said something that was really cool and, and Gary, I think you picked up on this one too. When we were meeting, uh, with Alex, it was how many times we are asked to pick up and move. Like the Lord calls us to go do some things, you know, whether it be in, in the instance, right, like he did for you to go pray with your father um, and or just other things where you were driving your father to and from the hospital over and over again. So that conditioning piece was you serving your father in a way, right, at the end of his life, you know, battling cancer, um, doing the right thing and being there for him. And that helped for the Lord to be able to condition his heart to be open to accepting him as his Lord and Savior before he passed, which is uh, just amazing. And then um, we talked a little bit about the foreign lands. So, I mean, mm. being born in Mexico um, and then almost just throughout the entire journey of your family kind of changing the course and then now being in this Christian faith, right, with your family leading your marriage that way. It's just so cool that it's foreign lands and deserts that you kind of basically traveled through, right? And you said it as uh, figuratively and literally, mm -hmm. right? Which is really neat. Um, so I uh, wanted to, to thank you, Gary. Um, did you want to? Yeah, so that was, that's beautifully yeah. said. But I think we, we do have deserts and we do have grasslands that we go through. But the fact that you took the opportunity to grow through that and the Lord mm -hmm. sustained you through that is absolutely marvelous. As Jason and I normally do at the end, if you could just share briefly some nuggets from your vast experience with dealing with all these different uh, uh, varieties of your life, what would you share with men right now that you would encourage them to take from your life? Well, I mean, I think it's related to this idea of, of deserts. If you look at scripture, almost, and certainly in the Old Testament, you see examples after examples of this. Anyone who has done anything for Christ, there was a moment in their life, and many moments after, but certainly a moment where the Lord said to them, pick up and move. Yeah. 
And I think that that is an example for all of us, but specifically for men. We are called to lead. We're called to lead uh, our families, right? And, uh, and so I think for men, one of the things that I would say is you're going to get that call. That's no question. Yeah. Whether that call is you are about to go into a desert, geographic desert, because I'm asking you to move and pick up your family. Or sometimes you're going to be called into a desert where it's financial crisis in your home. You're going to be led to a desert where everything is falling apart in your marriage. And you've never been in this emotional, psychological desert. So you're going to get called. My encouragement is, what can you do right now to prepare yourself for that? Yeah. I think another thing I would say related is that if you're preparing yourself, pray to the Lord that he will allow you to recognize when you're in that desert. Because if you can recognize it, if you can say, okay, I know right now I am wandering in the desert, it's a much different perspective because you, that's actually ordained. The Lord has done that to almost everyone. It's not just you. That's right. So, so recognize it. And then I think that as I've gotten older, my goal is now to, as, uh, to use God's wisdom to learn how to anticipate when those deserts are coming. Hmm. You know, and that's for my family. My promise to my family is, I, look, I don't know what's around the corner of our lives. I don't know that. But my prayer, my, or my promise to them is, I promise you that I'm just going to pray that the Lord gives me the wisdom to know that there is something coming around that corner. There's a desert over there. And, uh, and I think that the life of a Christian man is, it culminates in understanding and anticipating when those deserts are coming, because Amen. then you can prepare your family and everyone for it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you Amen. so much. Awesome. So Alex Aguirre here with us. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, guys, please don't forget to subscribe, uh, share this content with your friends and family. We're there on Spotify if you want to check us out there and uh, hear us out. Thank you very much for joining us, Alex. Thanks, Thank Alex. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Blessings a hundredfold. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next time on the Legacy Men's Podcast. You know, I had my questioning, searching period my first few years, you know, in my walk with Christ. And then it became, you know, I, I gave my heart over truly, finally. Mm -hmm. But it was still a lot was me focused, me and my relationship focused. But where it's really taken off and like become ex more exciting and just more fruitful is actually putting it into practice of mm -hmm. becoming the church and getting more involved. Like actually going to the men's groups, getting to know, know guys, getting out of my comfort zone and like teaching, which I've never done before, you know, yeah. things like that. But like the amount of men I meet and talk to that are all going through so many of the same struggles, yeah. you know, and like are coming at it, coming at life with the same, maybe not the same stronghold I had from fourth grade, but like when you look at it, we're all, so many men are like, they're living off of the insecurities from when they were a teenager. Right. Hmm.